Hello and welcome to Don't Lose Your Focus, Focus Management Strategies in React. Uh, I'm Rob, I front end engineer at Adobe, and I've been working on the open source project React Spectrum for the last four years. Uh, React Spectrum is a React implementation of Adobe's design system, and we created it with accessibility as our top priority. And not only that, but we wanted to share all the hard work that we do to create accessible components. Uh, so without getting into the details too much, uh, React Spectrum is built out of reusable hooks, uh, where we've put all the behaviors that make a component accessible. And then I've also been fostering some good boys lately. And here are two photos of our favorite German shepherds. Uh, the top one is Tinsel, and the bottom one is Sultan. Uh, but you're here to hear about our focus management strategies, not be distracted by the dogs that I've fostered. OK, one more detour, then we'll focus on the task at hand. Uh, I was trying to take a couple of nice pictures of Sultan, and I'll describe them here. Uh, the first photo is in focus with Sultan gingerly starting to grip the toy that I'm holding. Uh, this is just moments before he begins twisting to take his toy back in his determined way and completely blurring the second photo. Two focus jokes in one, we're off to a great start. Uh, so much like Sultan's absolute focus on his toy and this first photo, let's get to it. So in my introduction, I mentioned that React Spectrum is built on top of hooks that handle all of the accessibility attributes and behaviors for our components. Uh, these hooks are published separately to our component library, and we use them to build all of our components. And these libraries are called React Aria and React Stately. And we'll be focusing on React Aria today. So what is React Aria, and why is it useful? Uh, React Aria is a collection of hooks and components that implement various Aria patterns uh, or aid us in implementing them. And the hooks support internationalization and help to normalize behaviors uh, across different browsers and platforms. So take, for example, use button, which you might think is a pretty simple implementation when in fact it actually contains some complexities relating to behaviors across input modes uh, and focus behavior. Another is use combo box, uh, which took us almost a year to develop. So there's a lot going on there and we'll get to a little bit of what it does today. Uh, and another one that we'll spend some time looking at today is focus scope, which is a component that can do things like contain focus within a region or restore focus when it unmounts. Uh, React Aria is heavily tested, and we use it to build all of our components, and much of Adobe also uses those components. So what does one of these hooks actually look like? Well, here's the definition of use button. Uh, it takes props and a ref, and it returns uh, button props. And props accepts a variety of information or configuration about your button. This ranges from the typical event handlers your button component would use, such as on key down uh, and press handlers, to various attributes of the button, such as whether it is uh, disabled to, um, you know, ARIA attributes such as ARIA label. Uh, the hook act also takes a ref to the DOM node of your button, uh, so we can properly call focus on your button should it be auto-focused. Uh, the hook will then return a set of HTML attributes that you can spread onto your button component. Uh, these are attributes such as event listeners for handling click and press events, uh, various ARIA attributes to reflect your button state, or a uh, relationship to other elements, such as uh, if it controls a pop-up. Uh, so this is a pretty common pattern in our hooks to have refs to various elements. And again, that helps us to manage focus. Uh, one important prop that uh, use button takes is the element type prop. And this defaults to a button. This one's important because different elements allow and work with different attributes when you try to make them into a button. So for instance, a native button or an input uh, might accept the disabled attribute, but something like a span really needs to have ARIA disabled instead. Uh, or in the case of focus, a button or an input is already focus, uh, tabbable and focusable, so we don't need to do anything. Uh, but a span needs tab index of zero on it in order to make it tabbable. So by using our hook use button, you don't need to worry about the different behaviors. We'll do the work to normalize the behavior across the different element types. Uh, so here's a simplified version of how we might actually make use of the use button hook. And we can see in this um, that we just pass all of our props to use button. And then we spread the resultant button props directly on that element that we want to be the button. So in creating the various hooks for React Aria, we've come across a lot of places where browsers or assistive technologies fall short. Uh, and this includes a lot of focus management. Um, I'm showing uh, a small portion, but this table is actually over 80 rows 
uh, filled with assistive technology and browser bugs that we've taken the time to file, a good number of which React Aria works around. Um, I don't expect you to read this whole table. We have it in our GitHub repo if you're interested in seeing what all we work around and what bugs we've filed. Uh, so how did we find all of these bugs, you might ask? Well, as I mentioned, we do a ton of testing. Uh, don't worry, there won't be a test on this slide. It's just here to illustrate how many different combinations we take into account. Uh, and this doesn't even show that we also do our testing across uh, left to right and right to left languages, dark mode, light mode, and Windows high contrast mode as well. Uh, in addition, much of Adobe is using our components and hooks, so we're dog fooding. Uh, and we also work very closely with Adobe's accessibility team, and they frequently join us in testing our components. So what are our hooks and components that help us achieve this level of quality? Well, I mentioned earlier that we'd talk about focus scope. And focus scope is one of our components for managing focus within a, you guessed it, a scope um, or a subtree, if you like. We frequently use focus scopes inside of dialogues, menus, any sort of popover, really. And this is because it can do things like uh, contain focus so that we cannot leave the scope. So for instance, let's say you've opened a, uh, a are you sure modal. You don't want the user to do anything else until they've acknowledged the action. Uh, so they shouldn't be able to interact with anything outside of the modal. Uh, and the focus scope can also restore focus, which is important when your dialogue closes. You want focus to return to where the user started the action. Uh, you don't want focus to go to the body. That would mean that the user would have to potentially navigate through a very large chunk of the page in order to get back to what they were previously working on. So instead, our focus, our focus scope tracks where focus came from when we first entered the scope. And we do our best to restore focus there when the scope unmounts. Uh, focus scope also has some other features that I've listed out here, allowing nesting and working with React portals. Uh, so here we can see a simple example from our doc site where focus is contained within the dialogue. We keep tabbing through it and we never leave it. And then when we finally close the dialogue, focus is restored back to the triggering element, that set profile button there. But focus scope is more than just an area that contains and restores focus. It also comes with a focus manager on its context that allows you to move focus yourself within the scope, which brings us to the focus manager. So things that the focus manager can do um, are move for focus forwards and backwards, and it can move focus to the first and last elements within the scope. And we use it to implement things like a uh, roving tab index, such as you might find in a non-native radio group. Uh, we use it in several of our components where navigating use, er, uses arrow keys. And we can use it easily inside of a focus scope because it's on the context, but that's not a requirement. Uh, it does have one limitation that we'll talk a little bit more about, which is that it requires uh, all nodes to be in the DOM. And this has to do with the implementation of the focus manager, which utilizes something called a DOM tree walker in order to move focus around. So if you're unfamiliar with the tree walker API, uh, it enables us to traverse the DOM searching for tabbable or focusable elements inside of the focus scope. And we can do this with a filter supplied to the tree walker when we create it. This filter can actually enable much more than tabbable or focusable but these are our primary use cases for it. And we can actually do things uh, like distinguish between focusable and tabbable. Um, when we ask the tree walker for the next element uh, from whatever its current element is, it'll go in DOM order and it'll return the first element that matches our filter. And the best part is tree walker isn't something new. This has actually been in browsers since around 2014. Um, I know I was shocked. I only learned about it during the course of working on this project. So uh, one thing to keep in mind though, uh, typically React doesn't want you to go snooping around in the DOM. Um, however, we found this to be necessary because you can't search the React tree itself. And as long as we're doing this all in one synchronous go, this is quite reliable. Uh, we never need to worry about React updating the DOM out from under us because when we need to walk the tree again, uh, we'll just start from the last known component of interest and again, synchronously walk to the next element that matches our criteria. Uh, this pattern also allows our components to share space uh, with parts of the DOM that React or React Spectrum or React Aria don't manage, uh, or even components from other libraries, uh, which can be great things for uh, legacy products or working with other UI libraries. So to help show a use case for this, uh, I pulled one of the lines from the earlier slide with the bugs that we've reported. 
And this bug is an accessibility bug, which is radio group orientation horizontal. Uh, the left and right arrows go the wrong way in RTL. And the first thing that we'll want to uh, do is verify and demonstrate this bug. And so I'm going to, this is actually a video with audio and closed caption, so I'm just going to hit play on it. Is to verify that we still have a difference between Chrome and Safari, which we can pretty easily do that. So I have here um, a code sandbox uh, that might have a, a pretty normal setup for a pretty quick attempt at a radio group. Uh, we're using a uh, native control because that's usually the best place to go for uh, accessibility. Um, so we make a, our initial radio component and it's got an input and a label. Um, and then we also give it a, a name so that it can be part of a group. And then we make a radio group, um, which we do that with a div that we've set the role radio group on. And we've also decided that uh, our radio group can only ever be horizontally laid out. And so we've added aria orientation horizontal. Um, and then we're gonna take that uh, radio group and radios and we're gonna just plug that into a, uh, an application. And then I'm also going to um, put the application into a right to left language. And I'm gonna do that by uh, making use of a React Spectrum uh, component called Provider um, that just lets me easily change the, the locale of my application. Uh, so now that everything is set up, uh, let's go ahead and actually try this in a browser. So I've got here uh, Chrome on the right, and I've got uh, Safari there on the left. And uh, in Chrome, I'm just going to uh, tab into this. And uh, we can see the key that I'm pressing there along the bottom. And so I'm going to press the uh, right arrow, and immediately I wrap all the way around, and I'm at Louie. And if I press left, I go back to Huey. Uh, and if I continue to press left, you know, I'll go through the, the list of them and same thing for right. Now I'll go over to Safari. Um, I'll tab into it and then I'm going to press the right arrow. And we've moved to Dewey. That was to the left. Um, and if I press left, well, suddenly I've gone back to Huey. So that's gone to the right. And what's more is if I press the left arrow yet again, um, nothing will happen. So I won't wrap around or anything. Um, and same thing going you know, to the far end. So if I keep pressing the right arrow, uh, nothing will happen. And so we've, we've now verified that this is still an issue that uh, we can solve. So what can we do about this? Well, we can use our focus scope and focus manager to move focus the correct way. If you remember from earlier, I mentioned that a focus scope comes with the focus manager. So let's start by putting a focus scope around our radio group. We'll do that there, and we'll end it right after the radio group. And if you were building this in your own application, uh, you could actually put that inside of your radio group. But for brevity, uh, for this example, I'm just going to uh, put it on the outside. So now we have access to the focus manager inside of the radio group. So let's go ahead and pull that out as well. And we can. Uh, pull that off of the context using uh, the use focus manager hook. And then I know that we're also going to have to deal with locale direction uh, once we actually start listening for keyboard events. So let's go ahead and get that as well. And so we can do that with this little use, lo use locale hook, um, which works with the React Spectrum provider, uh, and it'll pull the direction of the given locale off of the provider. So we set that. If you recall down here, uh, locale is set to Arabic. Um, and so, yeah, so we're just going to pull uh, the locale direction right off of the provider. Uh, so now we have enough information that we can start um, actually listening for uh, keyboard events. And so I'm going to pull that in here. And I know this part's going to be a little long initially. Um, and I will take a moment to go through it just as soon as I've finished adding it. Keep down. Okay, so um, the first thing that we're going to notice is that we're doing uh, prevent default, and this is because native radio groups actually already implement a roving tab index. Um, so we don't actually have to do it here. All we have to do is take over the part where the arrow keys move it left or right, um, and to do that, we just prevent default. Um, and then uh, the what we're going to do when we actually get an arrow right or arrow left uh, depends on the direction that we get uh, for the locale. So um, we want to either focus previous or focus next, depending on that. 
and we want wrap to be true. And that, that'll keep us uh, constrained within the focus scope that we wrapped around our radio group. That's why I didn't wrap around anything else, um, only around the focus, uh, only around the radio group. So now if we you know, hit left or right at the edges, it should bring us to the other side. And so let's go ahead and save. And then let's go ahead and refresh our examples. And okay, so I'm over here on the right in the Chrome window. And if I tab into this and I press left, we go left. And if I press right, we go right. And if I continue pressing right, we will wrap. And if I press left, we will go back to the beginning. Uh, so this is all behaving as it was before. And now if I go over to Safari and I tab in and I press the left arrow, uh, we go left and it'll actually wrap around as well. And if I press right, we'll wrap back around to the right. Uh, great, so we've solved our bug. Um, I'd like to take a quick moment and point out that if you use our component level hooks for radios and radio groups, this bug and more have already been addressed, and so you don't need to re-implement it. Uh, the code that we wrote directly into our components for the sake of brevity uh, has actually already been pulled out into those hooks. Okay, so we pretty quickly ran into some issues with some of our more complex components. Uh, maybe elements weren't in the DOM all the time because it was a virtualized um, or an element was a part of a tree hierarchy where its parent hadn't been opened yet. So enter our collection hooks. We have a single API that we call our collection API, and that can handle things like lists, tables, and trees, because really, what isn't a tree these days? And while writing components using collections, uh, we found that it was pretty easy to lose focus to the body. Maybe we collapsed something that contained the focused element, or we deleted a focused element. Um, and when that is removed from the DOM, focus is lost. For those who are unfamiliar with virtualizers, uh, they are components that can handle rendering uh, extremely large sets of data efficiently by only rendering what fits into the current viewport in reusable containers. As a user scrolls through the data, containers move out of the viewport, dump their contents, and are filled with new content from the data set on rotation much like a conveyor belt. Uh, my editor says like a travelator. I said like a moving sidewalk. We compromise. She's Australian. Uh, as you may imagine, discarding DOM nodes can cause issues with focus management. So we developed some hooks and components that could help us with these issues. Uh, the hooks are a little bit tied to our collection API, so I'll talk more about the strategies that we used here. Uh, to illustrate what I mean about losing focus, I've put together a quick video showing a very common problem. Uh, in this video, uh, I've used Nerdy Focus, which is a Chrome plugin to visually and obviously track the focus. Uh, you'll see it as a bright red box uh, on the screen. And so in this example, we're in a virtualized list and we're putting focus on a list item. Then we're going to scroll the focused item out of view, as I mentioned in the last slide. Uh, and that means that our DOM node will lose all of its content and it'll be reused for another item. Meanwhile, uh, focus is sent to the body of the document. And we see here that when we scroll the element that's supposed to be focused back into view, uh, it doesn't get refocused either. Play that, we will go and select an item, and then we'll scroll it out of view. And we see here that focus was lost to the body. We'll scroll it back into view, and we see focus is still lost. So how do we handle these kinds of interactions? Well, here we can see an overview of how our focus management for collections works. And I'll be breaking this down further in a couple of slides. But the key takeaway from this is just that focus is never lost to the body. So we're going to, again, select uh, an item in our list. And we're going to scroll it out of view. And then we're going to scroll it back into view. And then we're actually going to uh, leave the uh, collection. And then we're going to come back into the collection. and. At all times, uh, focus goes somewhere that is uh, meaningful um, and, and obvious. So what are some of the hooks that we use to deal with these problems? Well, first off, we have a top level series of hooks for specific components that will handle everything for you. Uh, those are listed there on the left. The lower level hooks that we use to build the component level hooks uh, can be quite complex, and we haven't solved everything with them yet. Uh, so they're still awaiting some documentation. And they include two that we'll talk about today, the use selectable collection and use selectable item. Uh, they also include use grid, which will eventually cover grid navigation as well as edit mode. Uh, that one is still uh, pretty early in progress, so we won't be spending any time on, on that one today, unfortunately. Um, 
I've also included our virtualizer here, and it's not that you would need to use our virtualizer, uh, but the problems that we're solving for are commonly found in virtualized components. So I want to talk about what we've done in our virtualizer as well. So what is use selectable collection? Well, it's a hook that manages interactions with selectable collections. Selection is actually a fairly small part of the responsibilities of this hook, though, uh, counter to the name. Uh, it actually handles tracking the focused key or item, it handles type ahead lookups, and it handles arrow key navigation. Uh, one important thing that I'll say is that we treat most of our collections as a single tab stop. And so within them, we actually use the arrow keys to navigate. And because a collection might contain elements that are rendered to other places in the DOM, such as a, a menu or a popover or anything using React portals, this hook ensures that the events that we handle originate from elements within the collection. And it also has a partner hook, which is use selectable item. And that hook handles events on the items themselves and is actually really the hook more involved with managing selection. Though it does do a couple of things that aid us in focus management as well. So our hooks can do a lot, but they need to be aware of the possibility of virtualizers because virtualizers present special challenges uh, when it comes to focus management, as we saw in the video that I played. So to make the hooks generic, we needed a strategy for dealing with the virtualizer edge cases. So our strategy for managing focus is the following. Uh, put focus on the collection when items are out of view. Restore it to the item uh, if it comes back into view. And in general, treat the collection as a single tab stop. And in the next three slides, I'll show you each of these. So the first step is that when the focused item is scrolled out of view, we send focus to the collection. And our hooks keep track of whether or not the focus is currently in the collection, uh, what item should be focused, and if that item is currently visible in the view. Uh, if we scroll the currently focused item out of view, then we give the collection a tab index of zero and we call focus on the collection itself. So we can see that here, we'll select an item from the list and we'll go ahead and scroll it out of view. And you can see here that uh, nerdy focus is indicating focuses on the collection itself. Um, if we have focus on the collection and the item that should have focus scrolls back into view, we want to restore focus to it. So again, our hooks track if focus is in or on the collection, uh, what items are currently in view, and when the item that should be focused is scrolled back into view, it's actually mounted again. Uh, and if it's the focused item, it'll call focus on itself and take it away from the collection. Uh, tracking focus and state and letting components call focus on themselves when appropriate has been a great pattern for our collections. Uh, it removes a lot of the need to pass refs around. And after the item is called focus on itself, we remove the tab index of zero that we set on the collection, again, keeping to a single tab stop. So we can see here, uh, we scroll our previously selected item back into our previously focused item back into view. Um, and it becomes focused and the collection is no longer focused. And finally, if we want to tab out and maybe change the scroll position before returning, uh, we will not only restore focus to the last focused element, but we'll actually auto scroll it back into view. And from the previous two slides, uh, you know that we're tracking the focused item and when it scrolls out of view, we set the tab index to zero on the collection. And this case is no different. When we leave the collection, uh, nothing special happens, but we, when we scroll the previously focused item out of view, we do set that tab index to zero again on the collection. And so when we shift tab back, we'll actually go to the collection first. Uh, the collection then knows that it has a focused item. And so it scrolls the collection to the appropriate place. And when that happens again, the item is mounted again and it calls focus on itself just as it did before. So we again have the same focused item uh, in this video, and we'll immediately tab uh, out of the collection down to another link, and we'll scroll the uh, focused item out, shift tab back, and we are back on our uh, previously focused item. Uh, as a last note on this topic, uh, it may be that there are many focusable items between the currently focused item and the next focusable thing outside of the collection. Uh, so for instance, maybe you have some buttons in your list uh, or table on each item or each row. Uh, to deal with that, we make use of the focusable tree walker that we used in Focus Scope and Focus Manager. And when tab is pressed inside of a collection, uh, we go and we find the last focusable element in the collection. We move focus there. Uh, and then we actually let the browser handle the event to move it outside of the collection for us. 
So because we know which key should be focused, we're not just limited to restoring focus to the previously focused key either. Uh, when we first enter a collection, if we tab into it or shift tab into it, uh, we can have the collection go to the first or last elements respectively, uh, like we do in this screen recording, which I'll show in a moment. Uh, the first interaction will be tabbing in so that we land on aardvark. Uh, then we'll reload the page and we'll go to the last input and we'll shift tab in. Um, and we actually go to an element that is not even in the DOM, uh, the very last element, which is wombat. So here we are on the first input. We tab in, we land on the first item in the list. We refresh, we go to the last input, we shift tab in, and we go to wombat. Uh, for those unfamiliar with type ahead lookup that I mentioned earlier, this is a great feature for traversing long data sets. Uh, as we can see here in this list of Pokemon, we have focus on um, the Pokemon Bulbasaur, and then we type CH and we get moved down to Charmander. And then we type GEN and we'll get moved down to the Pokemon Gengar. And all of this is powered by the hooks that I just mentioned. Um, so we're going to track the focused key. And because it's a collection, uh, we know all the text contents. And so we can move down to the item whose te text matches the characters that we typed. And again, because this is virtualized, uh, Gengar isn't actually in the DOM when we start typing that name. So I'll go ahead and play that here. So we start off on Bulbasaur, we type CH, and we'll move down to Charmander, type GEN, and we'll move all the way down to Gengar. Um, so what if you have a situation where DOM focus isn't supposed to move, but you still want to have the same focused key tracking and scrolling behavior? Well, another component that makes use of the use selectable collection hook is combo box. And in this component, we found several areas that needed focus management, in addition to the work that the collection hooks were already doing for us. Now, one moment. OK, so at first thought, uh, using ARIA Active Descendant sounds like a great way to manage focus for combo box. The description of this attribute is, the ARIA Active Descendant attribute identifies the currently active element when focus is on a composite widget combo box, text box, group, or application. So this is perfect. This is exactly what we need. And we did use ARIA Active Descendant. However, we found that it had a few problems, uh, partially due to how new the attribute is. ARIA Active Descendant solved our screen reader announcement issues, though with some limitations due to its screen reader support. Um, it was overly verbose with VoiceOver and NVDA and would get in the way of reading the current input text. Um, or sometimes it just wouldn't read anything at all. So we had uh, we have some logic to fill in some of the holes and announcements using ARIA Live Regions. However, we were still left with the issue of how to visually show the focused item in the list box since DOM focus had to remain on the input element. And to solve this, we introduced virtual focus within our collection hooks. So knowing that we have the focused key, instead of calling focus on items, we emulate it while retaining focus on the input. And this emulation uh, includes scrolling to items and showing focus styles on that, on that item. Uh, in the video that I'm going to play here, we'll see that while a user is interacting with the combo box, focus never leaves the input element, even though focus styles are moving around in the list above. So we can see here we enter the input, we start typing some things, we start scrolling through the list of options, but focus has not left that input. Thanks. Um, so just before I start talking about ARIA Hidden, uh, I wanted to talk about another cool feature that we implemented in Combo Box to solve the issue of keeping focus on the input. So the button on the right-hand side of the Combo Box that you can see here in this image, uh, while it can open the menu, it shouldn't receive focus. And so we actually exclude it from the tab order. Uh, instead, when a user clicks on it, we move focus over to the input field if focus wasn't already there. Uh, keyboard users actually never need to use it because they can open the menu by typing or by using an arrow key combination. Uh, and touch, mouse, and screen readers, once they've opened the menu, uh, they usually need to type or select an, an item next. So again, we send focus to the input. So now on to ARIA hidden. So the other interesting aspect to uh, combo boxes is that screen readers need to be able to navigate from the input to the list in order to make selections. Unlike our menus or dialogues, uh, which hide all the other elements on the page, other than the modal and dialogue itself, 
uh, screen reader users actually still need to access the input element when the drop-down menu is open. Uh, if the input is hidden, they wouldn't be able to further filter the list of items, and they would have to close the menu every single time they wanted to type something new in the field. Pretty annoying, right? Uh, in most examples for ARIA implementing a combo box, the popover list box is typically right next to the input. This presents some problems, though, uh, as any containers with overflow hidden could unintentionally cut it off. So frequently, people implementing a combo box in React uh, make use of something called a portal to attach the popover directly to the body element. And then they use a positioning library in order to make it appear as though the popover is attached to the input. This, however, presents a problem for screen readers, uh, as they may need to navigate the entire document to get to it. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, popovers typically make use of focus scopes with contain, so screen readers may not even be able to navigate between the input and popover. Uh, so we have a utility function that helps us with this. It's called aria hide outside. And again, we'll crawl the DOM looking uh, using the tree walker and apply aria hidden to everything that isn't the input or the popover. And this makes it appear to the screen reader that the input and popover are next to each other. And yes, I realize that I've made what would appear to be a React cardinal sin again. I am now modifying the DOM outside of React's control, not just reading it. But I promise that we do that we are very intentional about this. We watch all of the elements that we modify, uh, and we watch for new nodes being added using a mutation observer. And this allows us to make sure that we don't try to restore attributes on a node that have been removed, um, and we can add aria hidden to any new nodes that need it. And we needed to be able to do this because we might be in an app where we aren't the topmost component in the tree. And we certainly won't control everything that gets rendered as siblings to the root of the React app. So this was the only way to hide all of the appropriate elements. OK, I wanted to bring attention to one other interesting edge case that we came across. And this one isn't quite as general as some of the previous ones that we've covered. Um, it's specific to certain components and certain situations. And in this case, uh, in particular, number fields press and hold to increment or decrement. Uh, for those unfamiliar, uh, this has a native implementation. It is input type equals number, uh, which has little buttons on the side to increment and decrement the value in the field. These can be really tiny and hard to hit. Uh, so we built a version with easier to hit buttons, especially on mobile. And one feature that uh, these number fields have is that you can press and hold on the buttons and it'll auto advance as long as you're holding. Another feature is that you can set maximum and minimum value on the number field. And when you hit that value, we disable the appropriate button so that you know that you've hit the boundary. So because a keyboard user can, again, utilize these button behaviors through arrow keys, we actually want these buttons not to receive focus when you press and hold on them. However, screen readers will uh, screen reader users will need to access these buttons. And so this can lead to some tricky focus management because it may disable while the user is pressing and holding. And when this happens, focus can easily be lost to the body because a disabled button shouldn't have focus. So to demonstrate this, I put together a simplified version of number field. Um, this one has a max of five and it will increment after two seconds of pressing the increment button. And we can see that as soon as we release our pointer from the field, focus is lost to the body. So we'll go here, we will press that um, plus button, and after two seconds, we have lost focus uh, to the document body. So we initially thought we should move focus from the button to the input field when this occurs. However, when we tested on a mobile device, uh, this actually caused the software keyboard to open on us after the incrementing was done. Uh, and this is because the software keyboard will automatically open if focus is placed in a text input as the result of a user action. And unfortunately, the user pressing and holding on the increment button counts as a user action if we handle uh, the event during, um, if we respond during the handling of that event. So I want to quickly show the case where the keyboard would pop up uh, as it was part of our journey towards fixing this problem in number field. So in this number field, we have a min of zero. Um, and when we hold down the decrease button, it'll auto advance down to zero. When it gets there, the button will disable. And after that, and we lift our finger, uh, focus will be moved to the input, which will cause the software keyboard to appear. So we're gonna go and press on the decrement and we will decrease down to zero and then we release and the keyboard is now uh, visible. And not only that, but it actually moved the entire screen up uh, behind us. 
So instead, we found a different solution, uh, one that wouldn't move a user in the middle of an action or at the end. And in this particular case, we decided to make the disabled button focusable. Not tabbable, just focusable. This way, when the increment button is disabled, focus could stay on the button, and the user could decide to go to the input field or leave the component. Uh, but it would not open the keyboard, which was a really jarring experience. Uh, so in our current version, you can see the similar behavior, and the difference comes in at the end. Instead of moving focus over to the input, we leave it on the button, even though it's disabled. So we'll start with the same steps. We'll go over here, press and hold on the decrement, and when we release, we stay there. We've covered a lot of areas to be mindful of focus today. Uh, I've included some links to our hook docs, as well as some links to our uh, source code for dealing with focus. I've also included a link to the TreeWalker API that I showed earlier, uh, and the code sandbox where I fixed the radio group bug using our hooks and components. And I do apologize, I forgot to include this slide in my submission. This is my contact info. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that we don't get to today on Twitter. Uh, thank you all for coming. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much, Rob, for all that uh, information. That's a lot of information. And, and I'll work with Rob and uh, let's see, we can't get those slides also re-uploaded with his contact information. So that way, if you don't capture it here, you can definitely, as you uh, grab those slides later for reference, have Rob's uh, information for uh, uh, view as well. Because I think Rob and I were just talking about this. I hopefully those who are new to accessibility will definitely find uh, the accessibility community uh, individuals like Rob love a conversation, love questions, and and um, Rob, I'll say that we didn't disappoint because we've got some great questions for you from the audience, even in your presentation. So, the first question I'll ask uh, is a little specific, but I I think we're we're good with answering it, and that is. Um, can you let us know how well React Aria play with TypeScript? I know we had a conversation with TypeScript uh, earlier um, on this track. Can you give us some ideas of how well that plays together? Uh, yeah, sure. It, uh, it's pretty good. We are not a strict um, library, so we do have um, just a few instances where uh, I believe it's undefined or null sometimes gets a little lost. Um, but in general, we, we do use TypeScript in our library, so support is pretty good. Good, good. Glad to hear. Yeah, I guess uh, as those technologies come along, right, we will definitely want to be able to use those different ones. Uh, somebody asked, and, I, and, and just give your thoughts on this question, because you showed us a good example, especially around Chrome and um, Safari on how the browser behaviors were different, right, in one of the issues you found. So how much do you try to unify browser uh, behaviors across browsers versus just having the default behavior from the browser for native elements, uh, for example, radio buttons. I mean, I, I saw that and I appreciated it from the team of you really trying to unify so that user experience was the same across browsers. Uh, but, but how much does the team focus on that of, of I really want this pattern to be simple uh, or similar, no matter what kind of browser uh, that individual is using. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, the answer is, uh, of course, not a simple one. It is uh, very much, it depends on the context. Um, so if, if we think that it is truly a bug and it is harming users, we will try to unify it to the one that makes the most sense. Um, if it is truly something that is, you know, a user would expect in a particular browser, um, we'll try and leave that alone. Yeah. I mean, it's really well about, like you said, I think it's important to remember that is context is the key, right? I mean, yeah. it, it would be so easy to say, oh, I'm going to fix this for, for um, this behavior, but it's back to, um, you know, if it ends up becoming more frustrating and more um, uh, uh, difficult for the user, it, it, that doesn't work for them. That doesn't work for them. Um, by the way, I want to say before we go on the questions, uh, so you can you can pass the news on after the session. The puppy's got some upvotes on ideas. A lot of people said they they would stay for the puppy pictures, even though they came for focus uh, for, for the conversation. So uh, I know that makes GSDs feel proud when they know they get some upvotes uh, uh, because they're so pretty. There they go. There you go. <laughs> right. Exactly. Some good old boys there. 
Uh, so um, one of the questions that came up that may, hopefully you can uh, help give us more information is, have you tested the, the virtualized collection behavior with keyboard users, like putting focus on the whole list invisibly? Because um, that could be an unexpected behavior in, in some cases. Um, so can you talk about, and, and honestly, uh, Rob, if, if you can go in this maybe a little bit for us, uh, I was impressed by even your combination of browser machine when testing. Um, as we're talking about some of the behaviors you tested, if you just can go into some a little rationale behind uh, even some of that that you've used, because I know we've got a question on even on the amount of browser and uh, uh, experience uh, that you guys are testing as well. So I don't know if we can connect those two. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, yeah. So the, the list of or our testing matrix really was born out of uh, the very first component that we worked on, which was button. Uh, and we have actually a great three-part blog on how difficult it is to uh, normalize button behavior across browsers and uh, assistive technologies uh, that I very much recommend reading. Um, so that, that's kind of where that whole testing matrix was born from, was just that what should have been a, a fairly simple component in our head. Um, and then I'm, I'm sorry, can you restate the first part of the question? The first because of the question was about virtualized collection behavior with keyboard users, right? So putting that focus on that whole list um, might be an un unexpected pattern. So how kind of you have you done? I, I guess where I see this question is, have you done some usability testing with some of your patterns to just get feedback from a user community to say, Okay, this is now a pattern that that I can understand and see. Um, versus, okay, I'm going to change the focus onto the next item because you've tabbed out of a field. Does that make more sense? Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, so we we do work very very closely with um, various accessibility experts around Adobe uh, who go through and do uh, audits on on our code and make sure that we're providing a, a good experience. And we have shifted, um, you know, approaches on on several occasions, especially around collections, because they're uh, so so complicated. Um, you know, you have items that are literally being unmounted in the middle of the DOM, uh, where you used to have focus. Um, so we, as far as doing a official usability study, um, I don't think that we've carried out one of those. However, this has now been in Adobe products for like two, three years. Um, I'm unaware of any complaints around it so far. Yeah. yeah. So uh, real quick, someone did ask if you wouldn't mind reading, uh, reading it for the audience uh, and we'll definitely get it uploaded. But uh, if we have any questions for you, you've got your Twitter handle. Can you let the uh, participants yeah, bring that really back quick up. know what the Twitter handle is? So it's at snowy s-t-i-n-g-e-r yeah you can blame um like second grade rob for that <laughs> it's just been a, a a unique name that nobody ever takes so yeah. i just default to it even if it is a, a little strange to say <laughs> oh, that's word that's perfect you know that's hard, hard part of the hard part about picking a username is finding something that not everybody wants right and there's yeah Rob's GitHub as well, while using the same thing. So uh, I'm looking through the questions. It seems like we've done a good job with Focus Indicator. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, I want to leave it to you as we're getting close to time. Something you want to leave with us in your journey uh, and your experience um, for the participants. Is there something that you really want us to take with us um, as we start using these components and thinking about these components that from you, uh, it's one of those, I wish I, I wish Rob would have, would have known this <laughs> back when we started using these components or good thoughts for us as we start implementing this in our environments. Yeah, um, I think as far as things that I wish I'd known when I started this, uh, I think it's, I mean, so many things um, I was, by no means an accessibility expert, and I am still by no means an accessibility expert, um, but I definitely know more now than when I started. Um, and I, I guess the thing that probably stands out to me the most is how much you need to go around and look at what 
what has come before, what are good experiences, what have people found to be bad experiences. And this is actually summarized fantastically uh, in another talk earlier this week from uh, Sarah about, I, I believe it was map going off the map uh, with React Aria, or, sorry, with Aria. Um, yeah, I, I highly recommend watching that talk if you haven't had a chance to. Great, I mean, that I think one of your stories and I loved hearing your example there, right, is I'm not an accessibility expert. I, I don't feel like I, I am one now, but it wasn't something you shied away from because this is one of the things as developers, I think we need to remember, right, Rob? And that is you're helping someone do something yet tomorrow that they couldn't do today by implementing something like React Aria. And as developers, I want us to keep remembering as much as we can get into the ones and zeros, right? It's about people. It's about people, Rob. And I, I think uh, we, you and I were talking a little bit before session, I'm really impressed um, as as Adobe has, has put out these open source projects to, to let us know how important it is uh, to keep with people and think about people. So can't thank you enough today, uh, Rob, for your uh, presentation, for your experience, for your, uh, letting you, us know we can contact you with any kind of additional questions that didn't get answered today, or maybe questions that come up as we try to implement this uh, in our environments. Reminder to the participants is that this available uh, for WeWatch, and I would always encourage you to rewatch and, and pick up some of the examples Rob gave us. I thought they were great examples that we could uh, learn from, and, and then also those, those slides that had those uh, other resources we can go to. Again, I want to thank Rob for his time, his passion. We could definitely see the passion and the go goals that he showed us, and I want to thank everyone for your time uh, and interest in this particular subject. I hope you have a great uh, rest of XCon as we finish up today. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all again.